All right, welcome back. In our last lesson, we were talking about the DNA molecule and how these polynucleotides form this alpha helix in a double-stranded fashion like a twisted ladder. And I'd like to talk more about DNA molecules in this lesson as well, and really the functions of protein synthesis and replication. So we're about page nine. We had just finished writing out some complementary strands when the following um, examples where we wrote from five prime end to three prime end and wrote out the complementary strands. We're picking up with more information about DNA molecules, really with two separate processes, the process of replication and the process of protein synthesis. So let's begin by investigating replication first. The information that's stored in DNA is used to direct the synthesis of proteins as well as to undergo the process of replication. So replication is that process by which a DNA makes a copy of itself when a cell divides. We need one mother cell to create two identical daughter cells, each with an exact copy of the code in DNA. So replication is through the process of creating new cells. And then transcription is the ordered synthesis of RNA, remember that one-stranded molecule RNA, from the genetic information stored in the DNA molecule. So we'll talk about transcription as the first process, the translation of that information into a protein all through the process of three separate specific RNA molecules. So kind of putting it into perspective, we have a parent DNA, so this is what I would call the mother cell. And in the mother cell, the nucleus contains DNA. One of the processes of the DNA is to create a replication of itself. To replicate is to create a daughter cell, and actually there would be two of those when the cell actually splits. So an identical set of information passed on from the parent to the daughter cell. Now, in a parent DNA, when it wants to create proteins, it's the director of protein synthesis. The first part that will undergo is transcription of the genetic code out into the nucleus, out from the nucleus into the cytoplasm via an RNA molecule, and then the process to translate that genetic information into a specific protein. We transcribe and then we translate to build a protein. So the parent DNA, two major functions, to replicate and to direct traffic for protein synthesis. Let's look at the replication process first. And this is kind of a cool slide because it color codes the information very well for us. The original, what I would say mother cell, the original parent DNA color coded in blue here. Notice that we have one end that has a five prime to three prime. Oops, I've got to pause and take this, hang on. Sorry for that brief interruption. That was my department chair calling, so I took the call. We were talking about DNA strands. And notice that I had said we had color-coded the uh, mother or the parent DNA in blue. And notice that we see the base pairing, that A is to G. G is to C, C is to G, T is to A, that complementary base strand. Now, what will happen, and we'll see in kind of a step-by-step -step process, that we're going to break these hydrogen bonds and we literally unzip the DNA uh, strands from one another. And when we do so, we undergo a process called replication. And what happens is that one strand that was originally from the parent has a new complementary strand attached to it to give to the daughter. The second daughter that is created has the other parent strand. So if this first one received the pro uh, five prime, the second daughter receives a three prime and a complementary strand. So each new daughter cell has one identical strand, has the original strand from the parent and the other will be a complementary code. And let's take a look at that more in detail about the replication process. We're going to introduce a term called a replication fork. So during this process called replication, the DNA strands separate 
And then each serves as a template for the new strand. And that point in which the DNA unwinds is known as the replication fork. So thinking about what we're saying is, notice up here the strand is still together. When it unzips, hydrogen bonds are broken. Hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs has broken. And then what you see is that it has now unzipped. And when the two strands unzip, a process called replication begins. Replication begins and it proceeds from the three prime to the five prime N, the direction of the template for both the leading and the lagging strands. Notice on this side, this is the three prime end of, of the parent where we color coded in blue. Remember the previous slide, the parent or the mother DNA was color coded in blue. So that's the three prime end of the original mother. See how it's just now unzipping right here and it comes back down. I've just highlighted what we call the replication fork. It's the unzipped portion of the DNA molecule. And remember, this is millions of bases long in terms of a polynucleotide. Vocabulary. The leading strand grows continuously. The leading strand is from the three prime up towards the five prime end. That is what we call the leading strand. And it grows and grows and grows continuously. And it does so by creating a complementary strand just based on complementary base pairing. Now on this side, notice over here, this is the five prime end, three prime N of the other strand. We still always read from three prime to five prime, always, always. So therefore, this is called the lagging strand. The lagging strand is leading away from the replication fork. And then the leading strand is going towards the replication fork. The leading strand undergoes continuous, always, always growing continuous. And then over here, the lagging strand will grow just in little pieces only. So we proceed by making little um, replicate segments in the lagging strand. Now, all of this is color coded to remind us that we have complementary base pairing. When a DNA molecule unzips, it does so with the help of an enzyme. That enzyme is called DNA polymerase. All righty. And when it does that, it's just kind of unzipping and breaking those hydrogen bonds. And we come up with leading and lagging strands. Let's look at those closer in this slide. We said that the synthesis of a leading and lagging strand, we always read from the three prime to the five prime end, the leading strand growing continuously. always towards the replication fork in that leading strand. Now in this direction, reading from three prime to five prime on the other original strand of the molecule, we're going to create these lagging replicate segments that these are just small chunks of DNA molecules that'll be carried out and have their own function we'll investigate shortly. The lagging strand, again, reading from three prime to five prime, but it's leading away from the replication fork. And I mentioned DNA polymerase, the name of the enzyme DNA polymerase that breaks those hydrogen bonds and unzips the DNA molecules so replication can occur. All right, so replication, the process of taking a parent or a mother DNA and creating identical complementary strands so that the two daughter cells end up with one original strand and then a complementary code. 
Let's talk now about RNA molecules and the process that leads to protein synthesis. All right, leaving DNA, and now let's talk about RNA. The most important difference between DNA and RNA, well, there are several, but one of them is the sugar involved, and we understand the first would be deoxyribose sugar for DNA, but ribose sugar in an RNA. So the first is really just what sugar is present. It's different between a DNA and RNA. So the first difference is the sugar that's present. The second difference is the bases that we find. In DNA, we said that thymine is present. In RNA, it's been replaced with uracil. So the bases of a DNA are A and T, G and C. In an RNA, U binds with A and C goes with G. We're saying T gets replaced by U in an RNA molecule. The third difference is RNA is single-stranded, and I said much smaller than the DNA molecule. DNA is double-stranded, RNA is a single strand. Where it's only about, when I say smaller, it's thousands of nucleotides long, whereas DNA is a million plus. The three types of RNA molecule are called ribosomal RNA, abbreviated as rRNA. There's messenger RNA, which abbreviates as mRNA. And the last of the three is called a transfer RNA, abbreviated as tRNA. Each of these three types of RNA molecules plays a very key role in protein synthesis. Ribosomal RNA, the first of the three types of RNA molecules, is the site where polypeptides are assembled during protein synthesis. They're found on ribosomes. They're in the cytoplasm, and these really are the most abundant type of RNA molecules. Alrighty. RNA contains the sugar ribose, RNA does not contain the base thymine, but rather instead uracil. RNA is single-stranded, DNA is double-stranded. Just reviewing some of these notes we wrote. And there's three types of RNA. The first, ribosomal RNA. It provides that site where polypeptides are assembled during protein synthesis. They're found on ribosomes. And ribosomes, which is an organelle of a cell, is found in the cytoplasm. Ribosomal RNAs are the most abundant type. The second category is a messenger RNA. We said it's abbreviated as mRNA, and it carries the information from the DNA, which of course we know is in the nucleus, out to the ribosome where the rRNA is located. And the third type of RNA molecule is known as the transfer RNA and that's abbreviated tRNA. And that's going to bring the specific amino acids that we studied in our protein chapter to the ribosomes for the protein synthesis. Remember those amino acids? There were 20 amino acids that I made us remember those three letter codes for all of those building blocks of proteins. Well, we read those codes, the transfer RNA reads those and brings them back to the uh, messenger to bring out then the protein synthesis process. Let's explore these three very detailed. The first, the transfer RNA. You're gonna see this drawn as a clover leaf structure. And do you see that clover leaf? I have that uh, kind of copied and pasted into your note pack on page 10. That T transfer RNA is a clover leaf shape with an acceptor stem at the three prime end, and it carries the needed amino acid as an anticodon and identifies the amino acid for the protein being required. 
here's where you need to notice that I highlighted in yellow. I'm now going to highlight it in green. ACC, you see that? That's the uh, information there that's going to go through the acceptor stem. And down here, I highlighted earlier in yellow, I'll now highlight it in green, is the anticodon at the end of the stem. So we have two very important regions. You have the first region, which is the acceptor stem. This is right here, the acceptor stem. Notice that's highlighted right here. That's going to give us a code at the three prime end. The anticodon is down here, and the anticodon is red to identify the amino acid that's needed for the protein. Okay, we're looking at a transfer RNA leading from the three prime end down to the five prime end. So keep in mind what we're kind of talking about here. Let me just clean the slide. Uh, at the three prime end, we have the sequence of basing in the acceptor stem that is not bonded, it's not attached to the uh, other end of its strands. So think about this as a single strand and it's in a four leaf clover shape. So it just is the same strand just twisted upon itself to give us four leaf or four leaf clover appearance. However, at the top of this structure, we have a section of the strand that is not hydrogen bonded against the other side of the same strand. So it hasn't coiled all the way around. It's left a little bit exposed. That's known as the acceptor stand. And down at the very end here, you'll see that this particular region is going to be known as the anticodon. And that's going to be this very specific region that identifies the amino acid. And we'll learn how based on the sequencing of the code right there. The transfer RNA keeps going upon itself, kind of wrapping around, forming hydrogen bonds to keep itself in this unique shape. Alrighty, so just looking at a clover leaf shape of a transfer RNA, you have a three prime end that serves as the acceptor stem, which carries the needed amino acid. So that's the site that it's attaching an amino acid to for protein synthesis. Opposite that end, you have an anticodon section that identifies what amino acid is needed. So the anticoder identifies reading the code, and this is where it carries the amino acid then back for the site of protein synthesis. This process called transcription is the synthesis of messenger RNA from DNA. Alrighty, so moving into the next section, this is 22.6 in our notes called transcription. It's defined as synthesizing messenger RNA from the codes in DNA. We said that when the DNA splits into two strands, it serves as a template. And that template strand is then used to synthesize the single-stranded RNA molecule and the informational strand which is not used. Two key words, template strand synthesizes RNA. The informational strand is not used when synthesizing RNA. So DNA is two-stranded. One strand is used to read, to code for RNA. The other strand is not. Transcription always proceeds from the three prime end to the five prime end, always, always, always. Just as we saw in the process of replication, transcription reads the same direction, three to five end. Transcription forms a messenger RNA that has a complementary sequence to the template DNA in an exact sequence as the informational DNA strand. But there's a very important difference Remember that a DNA will have the base thymine. It gets replaced with uracil when reading to make the messenger RNA code. Transcription. Here we have a DNA molecule. I know it's a DNA because I can see that it's made of two strands twisted upon itself in a double helix. 
we unwind, which means we're going to break some hydrogen bonds between those complementary base codes, and we open up, we unzip the two strands and show the genetic information. One of the strands serves as the code, the other does not. Remember those two words here? One strand is called the template, the other is the informational strand. Only one of the two strands is used to read to make a messenger RNA. Alrighty, we always read from the three prime end to the five prime end, don't we? Three prime to the five prime end. And so notice that the three prime is the one that's getting opened up and read to make the RNA molecule. So this is a single-stranded RNA, and it's using complementary base pairing to create the messenger RNA. Single-stranded. The sugar has been replaced. Remember, this is double-stranded. This has deoxyribose sugar. This has ribose sugar. This has thymine. This replaces it with uracil, that base for the complementary base pairing. And when I open up a DNA molecule and begin coding for a messenger RNA, it's going to create from one strand only based on complementary strand, uh, complementary base pairing. So for example, if your template strand, the template strand is used to build the messenger RNA. Can you write that in your notes and then emphasize it? It builds, I'll write that neater, sorry. Builds the messenger RNA. The template is what you read. So you're going to have complementary base pairing. You notice you read from three prime to five prime. Read in that direction, three prime to five prime. So again, complementary base pairing for messenger RNA, C goes to G. This is the DNA molecule, right? T, present in DNA, codes for A and RNA. A would code for T, but it's not. In an RNA, it codes for U, but it back to the complementary, it would go to T in the informational strand. This is the second strand of DNA. So you read the template to create a complementary strand of RNA, and the informational strand is just the complementary strand to the template that's not being read. The important difference as you read complementary base pairings is always remember A and T are in a DNA molecule, A with U as we code for an RNA molecule. Hello, Dash. Okay, I'm giving a lesson. That's my puppy. Should we practice? What is the sequence of, you know, the following is the DNA template strand. Alrighty, so this is the template. That's very critical to say, if these are the templates, this is what we code for the messenger RNA. What is the sequence of the template strand from which each of these following messenger RNA strands were synthesized? So if this is an RNA, what is the template strand? I know that it would read from three prime to five prime on the DNA template. That's what we're being asked to solve for. Given the RNA coding, what is the template from the DNA strand? Well, you, what would that code with? you would code with, is it T or is it A? What do you think? A goes to T, U goes to A. So this would be A, C, 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 G, A goes to T, U goes to A, U goes to A. 
That's the complementary coding when an RNA was created from the DNA. I have this wrong. I paused the video there, I beg your pardon, but I just thought I got off by one, and so I erased it and wanted to just emphasize and just redo it. So I thank you for your patience. I want to make sure I'm writing this correctly because it's critically important. We're calling that the, the um, messenger RNA, the RNA strand is what's given, and I'm asked to create the DNA template that was read. So I know that I'm reading a three prime to a five prime end in a DNA molecule and just giving the complementary base code. And just in case I got off by one, I wanted to redo it. And maybe I didn't. I erased it and then doubted myself. Have you ever done that? Just wrote something down and go, oh, that's wrong. And I'll just redo it. So again, U in DNA would code to A. G was C. So I'd have three cytosines in a row. One, two, three, four of them in a row. C, 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 C. And then I have the letter C, so that becomes its complementary G for guanine. A codes to T and U codes to A. So I'll have two A's in a row. There's the DNA template that gave me that code. And if there was a mistake, thank you for letting me work through it twice. Now let's try the next one. Maybe you want to pause and put your letters down first and then start the video and see if we match. Go ahead and, and give yourself some think time there. So again, we're given the RNA and we want to write the template strand of the DNA. C codes to G, C codes to G, G codes to C, A codes to T, C to G, G to C, A to T, U to A, G to C. We've just coded the original, oops, I needed the dash there, the original DNA template strand to code the RNA, noticing that there would be a complementary, or we'd call it an informational strand on the DNA molecule as well. That is the one that is not red. Okay, good work. I feel more accomplished that I double checked that. Oh, and then here's our answers. Did you get them right? Give yourself a big old star because it just feels good. A specific sequence in the genetic code is called a triplet. When we have a sequence of three nucleotides, we get a triplet code for a specific amino acid. Now let's remember what a nucleotide is. It's a ribose sugar. And I know that this is going to be in an RNA, so I'm going to put the hydroxyl group, right? And it's going to be attached here to the phosphate, and over here you're just uh, a nitrogen base. So just remember that that's what we mean by a nucleotide. This base is lettered, okay? So for example, A, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, but T is replaced with uracil in an RNA molecule. Those are the letters we code for a specific amino acid. So whatever base is right here, that is a lettered code, three of them in a row, and we get a code on. So it takes three nucleotides to create a code that represents a specific amino acid. For example, UAC, U, uracil, A, adenine, C, cytosine. That is a three nucleotide series giving you the bases in a row, right? So I would have a nucleotide that contains the base uracil, followed by, remember the phosphodiester linkage that attaches to adenine and another phosphodiester linkage to cytosine. Three bases in a row, that's a codon for an amino acid. This amino acid happens to be serine. 
Oh, and we spent time learning about the 20 naturally occurring amino acids. And we remembered how to look at the three letter codes that represent those specific structures. An amino acid has a typically a chiral carbon. Remember on one side we had the NH3 plus. On the other side we had a COO negative and then down here was an R group. And whatever the R group was gave the identity to the amino acid. And this was what we called a Zwitter ion, where the Ku COO carboxylic acid section was a negative, and over here the amine was a positive, NH3. So as we read codons, we're going to write them from the 5' prime to the 3' prime end on the messenger RNA. And this is just a little. Uh, math, given four different nucleotides in an RNA, that's adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil, there are 64 different ways to combine them into groups of three. Those 64 different color, uh, different coding represents a specific amino acid. These are what we call codons. 61 of the 64 code for an amino acid, and three are terminating for the protein synthesis. Okay, so we're saying that we have codons now, and let me just make sure we're recording. Time is going by, perfect. Alrighty. <laughs> 64 different codons mathematically, so four different nucleotides, A, C, G, and U, 64 different ways you can arrange those letters. Of the 64, 61 code for an amino acid, and three are terminating the protein synthesis. Now keep in mind, we said there's 20 amino acids, and 61 different codons means that an amino acid is going to have more than one possible code to denote it. Now, here is a slide, in our notes as well that gives us the genetic code. Do you see what this looks like in your notepad? It's a grid, isn't it? And I have it all on one page for your convenience. Let's learn how to read this code. All right, now remember these are triplets uh, in the messenger RNA. So three nucleotides, these are the base sequences. If the first base at the five prime end is a U, you're in this section. If the second base in the sequence is U, second base C, second base A, second base G. So you're looking at the second letter at the top. And then over here, the third base in the sequence coming from the three prime end is on the far right column. Alrighty, so for instance, if we had a code of UCC, how would we read that? First base is a U, so I'm in this section. If it started with a C, I'd be here. If it started with an A, I'd come here. If it started with a G, I'd come here. So I'm really just looking at the first base to figure out what part of the uh, grid I'm in. And I just gave an example of UCC because it was on the first page. Uh, first base is a U, second base is a C, the last base is a C. That puts me right here at UCC. That's coding for the base or for the amino acid called serine, S-E-R. Now see how critically important it is to remember your three letter codes for the amino acids in this section as well. S-E-R is the amino acid serine. Again, you don't have to memorize the amino acids by structure because that chart is always provided for you, but the three-letter code serine lets you go to that amino acid chart and find its structure. So you read first base, middle base, last base to find the genetic code of a triplet codon to read what amino acid is going to come up in sequence to start putting, you know, assembling a protein. 
So it takes two grids to get all 64 on there. Alrighty, so that's kind of why this whole entire page 12 of your notepad is the genetic code. Shall we practice? What amino acid is coded as GCC? GCC. All right, so let's practice G. The first base is a G. So that brings me here in that particular region. All right, so that's the um, first. That's the very bottom of the second chart, isn't it? Now the second one is a C. So the second base is a C brings me to this column. And the third base is also a C. So that puts me down here. I have to, to kind of intersect all three. First base is a G. There's the codon, see it, GCC. So what is the amino acid? ALA, alanine, isn't it? ALA, alanine. The next one in your note says AAU. How do we find AAU? Stroke the, I'm trying to get the eraser to erase, AUU. There, we got it. Okay, so in this next example, I call this letter B, A-A-U. So we're here in this area, here's the A's. The next one is an A, and the last code is a U. So that brings us right here. A-A-U in this genetic code of a triplet messenger RNA codon gives us the amino acid A-S-S, -S, asparagine, A-S-S -S is its name. It's three letter code. Letter C, C-U-A. Well, if the first base is a C, that brings us up to that next chart that's in this area. The next code is a letter U, so that's up in the top, letter U. And the last code, uh, the last base in that sequence is A. So that's here. Intersect all of those and you get your codon CUA listed right here, which is going to code for leucine, L-E-U. And I mentioned, see how many different codons there are for L-E-U? So there's not just one unique codon in this genetic code to represent each individual amino acid. Many different codons represent that same code for leucine, L-E-U. I'm going to encourage you to pause the video. And I've modeled the first three. Try reading this codon chart for letters D, E, and F, the next three examples, and write down just the three-letter code of the amino acid it represents, and come back to me when ready to check. Well, welcome back. You've used your genetic code. We had said the genetic code, the triplet code GCC, represented the amino acid ALA, alanine, asparagine, leucine, serine, glycine, and lysine. Those three letter codes representing specific amino acids from the messenger RNA. You have another practice. What codons code for each amino acid? So now you're trying to find all the different possibilities you can see, for example, for glycine. Should we do the first one together? Glycine, G-L-Y is your, your uh, three letter abbreviation for glycine. Do you see it anywhere in your genetic code? We're looking for G-L-Y, glycines. I don't see any here, do you? How about in the next one? Oh, look. Do you start to see them here? G-L-Y. I'm noticing that there are four different genetic code triplets to represent the amino acid called glycine. G-G-U, G-G-C, G-G-A, and G-G-G all represent the amino acid for glycine. And so when we're asked to do that one, we actually had three different answers to report. Do the rest. I'm gonna really encourage you to take some think time to do the following. 
You have to go back and review the three letter codes, don't you? Because this skill is really going to rely on saying, you know what, this genetic code, these slides here are giving me the three letter codes, and yet I'm being asked to give genetic information based on a name. I've got to remember what three letter codes for each of those amino acids are. So start with that. Write the three letter code. Next to each of these examples, that's supposed to be two, next to each example, and then go into your codon, the chart for the genetic code, and find which three bases, which is the codon for those amino acids. Give yourself think time, come back when ready. Okay, welcome back. You found glycine to have the genetic code we wrote together, GGU, GGC, GGA, and GGG. <laughs> isoleucine had the genetic code, had three different ones, didn't it? Did you find isoleucine? AUU, isoleucine, AAU, where did you find it at? A A U right up here and there it is and then you went on and found A U C A U A there were two different genetic codes for lysine triple A and double A G and glutamic acid had two codes as well G A A and G A G some of those make fun words don't they how about one more Derive the amino acid sequence that is coded for the following messenger RNA. Now, what does that mean? There are three codes, aren't there? Every three letters represents a codon giving me the identity of a specific amino acid. So as I go through and highlight every three codes, I'm giving you what's called a codon. And I want you to tell me what is the amino acid sequence that we're going to read as we create the, the protein. Pause your video, go back into your chart, and read the sequencing telling me what is this, the amino acid protein synthesis sequence. Pause, come back when ready. Did you find them? Well, let's check our work. The N-terminal amino acid, knowing that the N-terminal comes from the five prime, can we highlight in our notes how important that is? The N-terminal amino acid comes from the five prime end, and the three prime comes from the carbon terminal end of the amino acid, and it went in this order, didn't it? H-I-S, followed by L-Y-S, followed by T-H-R, V-A-L, L-E-U, and I-L-E, right? Do you remember what those stand for? With lysine, thiorine, valine, leucine, isoleucine. You just wanna keep saying those over and over in your mind. I'm gonna pause the video here and come back to wrap up the chapter with one final lesson, bringing translation and protein synthesis into its own little, it'll be a smaller video, but I wanna pause, give yourself some think time, rest, come back to the last video when ready. Good work today.